Well, today we uh, begin our study uh, officially in the book of 2 Thessalonians, and I'd like you to take your Bibles, and we'll get going here. Got a new iPad, so I got to figure out how it works. It's a little bit like the old one, but it doesn't have the old locking mechanism. At least I haven't found it yet. So let's stand and read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father, God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to always give thanks to you, uh, thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we, are, we ourselves ought to boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness in the fa and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God consider it, considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to, to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints because of our testimony to you was believed, and to this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every good work or every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. you may be seated. I know that this message is going to be so easy for you to hear this morning because the Nebraska Cornhuskers really pulled out a, just a, a miraculous win with the help of the officials, of course, uh, last night. I'm sure it was all legal, right? I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. I know we have some, some also some very happy um, fighting Irish fans as well because the, uh, they, they did really well yesterday. But it's great to have you to have you all here, and man, Marcy's been 20 years, can you believe that? 20 years since I was her youth pastor, so I'm, I'm sure I look a lot older, and I hope I'm a lot wiser, but it's great to see you, uh, see my kids that I used to kind of hang out with on every Wednesday night during Bible study and other times. Well, we all know that there are three indispensable resources that we can't live without in our physical life, right? We need what? Air, water, and food. And we're all doing good on the food, aren't we? Yeah. We never, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? Food is, never seems to be awesome. And we never go without that very long, do we? Um, and people have tested, right, how long they can kind of uh, push the limits of going without air. You hold your breath, the older you get, you probably know that you might, you might get 20 seconds, 30 seconds. I've watched these guys on television who do these contests where they go down in the water and see how long they can hold their breath. You know, they, they might get a couple minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Hard to say. It's amazing in all those movies when these guys jump in the water how they can breathe underwater forever, right? I just said, how's that? You know, if it's only on television. You know that. Because if you've ever tried to help hold your breath underwater, it just doesn't last that long. It seems like they're diving to save somebody, right? And they're going after them. It's just like, man, that was, that was more than 30. Man, that seemed like forever. Well, anyway, we can't make it with air, very, without air very long. And that's one of the things we often take for granted is that we have fresh air to breathe. And um, people have tried to go without water. But you know what? Maybe three at tops, four days, and you're gone. You can't do it. And then food, maybe 40 days, has been the length of some of the fasts that people have, have gone on. And it really stretches, obviously, the extent of your ability to function when you go 
that long. So let's apply this to the spiritual realm. And we talked about the physical realm. You can't go without air. You can't go without food. You can't go without water. Are there things in the spiritual realm that are in the resources that are indispensable? Things you can't go without in the spiritual realm that will, if you go without them, they're significantly going to affect your spiritual life. Well, obviously we know if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, one of the indispensable resources you can't go without is the Word of God, right? We need to be feeding our lives from the Word of God. Uh-oh, somebody, okay. It's God calling. No, not really. I better check my phone, right? Okay. I just love phones, right? So... What, are there things in this spiritual realm that are indecisive? We know that we need, we, we need the Word of God, and we need the Holy Spirit, obviously, is an indispensable resource working in our life, cooperating. Oh, there it goes again. I know what we could do with that. I'm going to wait. Max, you got that off? All right. Okay. This morning we want to look at three more from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And we notice Paul identifies what we call three indispensable resources for living your life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Three things that are, I would say are vital, necessary, and essential. Okay? Three resources designed to help followers of Jesus thrive in their spiritual life. Okay? Number one is the indispensable resource of the church. Probably going to be maybe the most challenging one when we think about it. Because it's not something we think is really indispensable. It's really easy in life to think, well, I can function very well spiritually whether I participate in the, with life in the body of Christ with Jesus and his body or not. And we often prove that. We try, to, we try to break the odds. We try to prove to ourselves that we can function in life spiritually without a vital connection to Jesus and his body. But when you look at Scripture, it never gives us that option. And we're going to look at that this morning. You notice we need a relationship with the church and with Christ um, to thrive spiritually. If you notice the first two verses of 2 Thessalonians, and you go back to the first two verses of 1 Thessalonians, what do you notice? Paul repeats the same phrase, right? He starts both letters with the same phrase, to the church, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in repeating the opening salutation, Paul is again emphasizing something very important to these followers of Jesus Christ. He is stressing to them the indispensable value of the church that they are a part of. They are the church. They belong to the church because of a relationship that was established by faith with Jesus Christ because of the gospel call where they responded to the good news that Christ has conquered our greatest enemies, sin, and death and hell, and has given us the hope of eternal life, the forgiveness of sins, a new life, and an everlasting life. And that faith in Jesus Christ put them into the body of Christ. Okay? So every disciple, every follower of Jesus by God's design was meant to experience the Christian life their life with Jesus in a vital relationship with the Father and Son and with other disciples, the church, other Christians. So it's clear from the teaching of Scripture, not just here, but in other places, that to live as a disciple of Jesus in a very hostile world, that re it will require disciples to participate, to fellowship, to connect with other disciples who are living their life in a vital relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you note that in both letters, the, 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 the church is addressed, right? Collectively. It's the ecclesia. 
It is the called out ones. It, are, it, it refers to those who have been called out to salvation by the good news that Christ has died for our sins. He was buried on the third day, rose according to the scripture. And as you re Respond to the call of the gospel, exercising faith, repenting of your sins, and turning to Jesus Christ to be saved, you enjoy now, at that moment of salvation, the privilege and the right of living in fellowship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the highest privilege you can experience in life, being in fellowship being claimed out of the world by the gospel call to a relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and others who share that distinction because of their faith in Jesus Christ. This is a very special designation. Just like last week, I, I talked about how we had been adopted. God has adopted us into his family as children. And being children of God is a very special designation, something to cherish, something to revel in, something to worship God, something to be excited that God has claimed you as his child. He wants you and me to be a part of his family, not just a family for today uh, where we experience loss and are separated. It is a family that you can be a part of forever, for, forever into eternity. Not only are we children of God, but through the gospel call, we also are the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. That's a significant designation. And while being offered membership in the body of Christ is available to all, it's available to every person. As you respond to the good news of Jesus, not every person, right, we know, not everyone really claims this special designation. And we're, in fact, there are many people today that really don't think it's all that great of a designation at all. And, and, and I can understand why people don't think being a part of the church in God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ is all that special. Because a lot of churches aren't all that fun place to be. It's not all that great part because of the, the, the conflicts and all of the hypocrisy and all the junk that goes on in church. You know, why, why is that so really all that special? And the only, reason I can, only way I can really answer that question is because God has claimed that it's special, right? God has said it's special. Because it is a body that has been redeemed, saved, has been experienced the, the wonderful grace of God in Jesus Christ and, and experienced the forgiveness of sins and a new life and hope that, that not everyone can claim in life, whether they want to or not, but not everyone claims that. And so it is a special, special designation. And I think Paul wants Christians to know being a part of the body of Christ is a very special thing. It's a privileged designation because of how salvation comes to us. It is God who comes to us. It is God that comes seeking us. God brought you here today to seek you, to, to, to tell you that he loves you, to tell you that he has a plan and purpose for you, not only today, tomorrow, and the next day, but for eternity. And he wants you to become a part of his family. He wants you to be a part of the body of Christ. He wants to call you into a relationship. This is God's doing. Our membership in the church, our participation in the church didn't come because we wanted to do it. It's because God sought us out. We did not choose him. He chose us. He made himself real to us at a time in our life where we were in crisis, where we were struggling, where we needed forgiveness, where we needed hope or something else. We needed to, to have uh, some, some of the defeat and discouragement uh, sort of wrapped, uh, uh, taken away from us, or we needed that sense of, of despair over our own guilt of our bad choices somehow relieved from our lives, and God brought that into our lives through Jesus. God brought that to us. So being in the, ch the, the church is not something that, that we necessarily claim for ourselves. It is something that God has given us the privilege of being a part of through his saving work in our life. 
And as you read through the Bible, you notice that God doesn't see a disciple of Jesus existing apart from a vital relationship with Jesus, right? Fellowshipping with Jesus and the body of believers. This is, this is expected. The Bible says you are members of one another. So in other words, if you're a Christian, you belong to the person sitting next to you, whether you know them or not, whether you care for them or not. They are part of an extended family of people who are called the church, the called out ones, who are going to spend eternity with each other in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, to attempt to function spiritually without a vital connection to Jesus and other believers, I believe, and I think the scriptures would confer it, will be detrimental to a believer. It's going to be detrimental to your life. Whether you believe it or not, it's going to have negative implications on how well you will be able to function in life as an individual Christian, but not only you, but it's going to affect how well the body itself is able to function. And I liken it to this. If you were feeling, it'd be like feeling a baseball team with seven players. Or it'd be like putting four basketball players on the court. And since it's football season, it would be like having nine guys on the field when your opponents are dealing with how many? Eleven. Right? We know that a team could put seven in baseball four in basketball, and nine in football on the field to compete. Well, but we know that there are nine players in baseball, five players in basketball, and 11 players in football, respectively. Now, if you had less players, right? Nine, four, and what? Or seven, four, and nine, you could still function, right? Sometimes it looks like teams are functioning with nine players, even though they have 11 right? Sometimes it looks like a basketball team has only got three, three players out there because the score is lopsided. Uh, some of the players may seem a lot distracted or just not into the game, not functioning very well, right? Teams can still function without all of its members participating. Would you agree on that? Yeah, a team can function. They can go out there. They can strap up the, put on the uniform, go out there, try to compete, they can do it with a limited number of players. But they, but they just won't participate and function just as well unless they have the whole unit working. Now, this is where it gets a little bit challenging, and I'm just going to say this. Not, not necessarily um, to hurt anybody, but just this is kind of the way it is. The same can be the case for the church of Jesus Christ. And many churches in our day, because I believe Christians today have what I call a Randy Moss attitude about partic participation. Now, you say, why Randy Moss? Remember Randy Moss, a tall, lanky, wide receiver for the Minnesota Vikings, war number 84, one of the best players to ever play wide receiver. But one of the shocking revelations came one day when news reporters were asking Randy Moss, how come it didn't seem like he put out on every play? He said, well, I take plays off. You what? Yeah, I just take plays off. You know, if, they, if they're running, if AP's running the other way, I, I, I just take it off. If it doesn't come to me, if it's not thrown to me, if, if I'm not in the center of this, I, I just take the play off. I'm sure his teammates loved him when he said that, right? You, you take plays off. They're out there busting their tails. They're trying to make this work. They're trying to, to get this ball in the end zone, right? They're trying to accomplish the goal. They're trying to get to the Super Bowl, and their best player says, I take plays off. If it ain't going to me, I, I don't need to be there. And, and I think in the church... It's, it's easy because of all the things that we got on our schedule and activities. We can take plays off. If I deem it's not in, to my benefit to participate, I don't. Nothing wrong with that, right? If it doesn't help me, if, it, 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 
I, I just don't need to be there. And I think it's easy for Christians to operate what I call a somewhat independent attitude of the body of Christ that they were united to when they responded in faith to the gospel message. It's easy to forget when we became Christians, we surrendered our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, right? What does it mean that he's the Lord? He means he is a, he's, a, he's, a, he's the master and we are the servants. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. We surrender to him, right? Because we saw him as a great master, someone who could save us, someone who could lead us and guide us, someone who could provide us the, the resources to live a, a good and beneficial and blessed life, right? We trusted Jesus to save us, right? And we might forget, in also coming to faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says we were married to Jesus Christ, right? We are married to him. You see, how's that? Well, the church is often called the bride of Christ. The bride. We're the bride waiting for the groom to come take us to the wedding dance, right? Called the wed marriage supper of the Lamb. We are a bride in waiting, right? And Christ is collectively bringing together his bride on earth through the preaching of the gospel. As people come to salvation in him, he's collecting his bride and he's preparing them for a wonderful celebration of the Mary Supper of the Lamb, when the groom, Jesus Christ, will announce his bride to the Father. Here is my bride. Here, here are the people that I purchased with my own blood. These are, these are people that are very precious and special because they belong to you, Heavenly Father, and you have saved them through my sacrifice, and it's going to be a wonderful celebration. We are married to Jesus Christ. And when we're married to Jesus Christ, we are collectively and relationally connected to others who are married to Jesus Christ. But it's so easy in our life and our times to consider, you know, I can take a week off, I can take a month off, that it becomes a regular habit to refrain from engaging with other members in the body of Christ, that I'm not only hurting my own spiritual life, but I could be hurting the life of other people who are sitting around me. And the reason people, that doesn't resonate really well with people, is because we live in a very low estimation of our worth and value in this world to others spiritually. We can see ourselves as very highly valuable to others in our educational pursuits, our work field, where people seek us out, we're competent, we're helping people accomplish their goals, we're uh, our company or whatever else, and we feel really competent that, that we have a place in this world. But somehow spiritually, when it comes to the spiritual realm of life, we really don't feel that we have much to offer, which is completely difficult for me to understand because you were blessed with every blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So your life is extremely valuable if you're a Christian, if you were saved by God's grace, if God dwells in you through Jesus Christ, your life has value, has meaning to the people sitting next to you this morning. Don't underestimate your value to the church of Discovery in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't underestimate your value. Jesus saved you for a purpose. Jesus fills your life for a purpose. Jesus becomes an integral part of your life for a purpose so that you can glorify him and you can touch the people sitting around you in your seats. You go, well, pastor, I don't know if I can do that because, you know, my life's kind of messed up right now. Jesus fixes the messes. And we're going to get to that as we go on in this message. But I, I really want you to know, as a pastor for 30 years now, I know there are people who may not see their value and importance to the body of Christ. I've witnessed that. I know there are people who kind of look at this and say, you know, the church needs me more than I need the church. 
So I'm going to determine how much time, how much labor, how much money, how much participation that I'm going to give based on what I believe will be beneficial to me. Okay? While I was in Sioux City waiting for my wife's plane to arrive a couple weeks ago, I was in a Christian bookstore, and I noticed this book that was written by Kyle Idleman. If you don't know Kyle Idleman, he wrote the book, um, Not a Fan. Some of us studied that book, Not a Fan. Kyle wrote a new book. It's on, it was on the shelf. I noticed it's called The End of Me. The End of Me. I'm kind of wondering how many people really want to read that book. You know, I really didn't need to read that book. All I needed to do is see the title. And what I gathered from the title, The End of Me, I think if someone read that book, it will serve to benefit the ministry of their local church where they enjoy the privilege and the designation of being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when we claim our membership in the body of Christ, we surrender our autonomy to the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? We surrender our autonomy to Jesus Christ. That isn't, I didn't, that isn't because I said that. That's what Scripture teaches. We, we surrender ourselves to the autonomy of the Lord Jesus Christ. We become servants of Jesus to His body. So His body can grow. So His body can prepare for the wedding day. So his body can remain pure until Jesus returns, okay? Now, how many of you have ever experienced a loose connection in something that is hooked up to electricity? We have a ceiling fan like that. It's the most annoying thing ever, right? It's a, you know, it's one of those old ceiling fans. It's got the light. It's got the fan that runs around, you know? And in our case, the fan always works perfectly. But we have limited light in the room and where it sits, and you can be pulling on that, jerking that chain, and sometimes it comes on, and when the fan is moving and it's wiggling, it goes off, and it goes on, and it goes off, and it goes on, and it goes off, and it goes on, it goes off, it goes on, it goes on. No, I'm not no electrician, but there must be a loose connection somewhere, right? And I'm just going, this annoying thing, you know, what a useless fixture. I mean, most of the time it's just taking up space. Why? Because you never know when it's going to work. You never know if it's going to be functional when you need it to be functional. And I I know it's really easy to develop what I would call a very casual or loose connection with Jesus in your spiritual life. Very casual, loose connection with Jesus and with his body, right? But I see that loose connections, just like my fan and my light, loose connections steal from us our energy and our passion for living for Jesus and participating with what I believe is the greatest living body of people on the planet, the church of Jesus Christ. You see, the church is not a building. It's not a religious institution. The church still exists once we leave here. It exists in our life, in us, We are the church. We belong to Christ. We belong to each other. So often people think the church is an institution that begs people for money. Aren't you glad we don't beg people for money at Discovery Church? I love that I never have to ask anyone ever for anything. God wonderfully supplies through the generous giving of people who are inspired by grace and the gospel to know that you can't outgive God, so we just give it, knowing he'll, he, he just brings it back. But so many people are down on church today, and I, I know, I understand why you can be that way. But I was, my hope, my vision, my thought, when this church started, is that this church could be different. 
that this church could be in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That even though we have our hypocrisy and we have our hurts and we have our pains and we have our frustrations, we have our, we have our times when we're not all we should be, we sometimes get upset, sometimes we say hurtful words, sometimes um, we're not always as friendly as we should be with people who are new to our church. Even though we have our shortcomings, that we are committed in Christ to, to each other and to the body of Christ, preparing ourselves for the glorious day when Jesus returns. That we're here to help one another and to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Whether someone shows up every week or when they come one week, it doesn't matter. I'm not here to judge you on your attendance. I just know that you have more value than you think you have. And we need every person here as much as you can be a part of this. Because I really believe... Not because it's a proud statement. I don't want you to see it. I believe that God has good things to tell us from his word. But I like it to this. How many books do you understand if you hear the first chapter, the seventh chapter, the eighth chapter, the tenth chapter, the fourteenth chapter? So often that's our connection to scripture. The only time we get it is when we decide to come and fellowship and participate with the body of Christ. And we only get part of the story. Thank goodness we have internet that you can watch what you missed last week. But I don't, know, so th- I don't know if that's always so good. I appreciate that you can keep up and keep track. But what is missing is the vital, dynamic, human connection that is so important for all of us. I mean, it's so easy for me to go hide in a cave. I could just sit and not be around people because, you know, it's just, just easier that way. You may think, oh, I just love being up in front of people all the time and just shaking your hand. I I have my moments where I just like to be by myself. But I know God created me. God gave me some giftedness. God saved me to be a blessing to other people, and he did the same for you and everyone else in this room if you're saved. And he wants us to connect to each other and to Jesus Christ so that we can grow. Think for a moment. How many of you would do well or how long, if your hand was severed right now from your body, how long would it function apart from your body? A couple minutes. You notice if that's ever happened, what do they do? They get it in a cooler. They keep it cold. They get you to the hospital as quick as you can because once it's severed, you know, it's this severed limb begins to die. Doesn't function as well because it's not connected to the life giving source of the arm that it's extended to. And I think the similar is true because the church is defined as a body. It's a body of believers and we need the connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need that vital connection. So I ask, how long, how strong is your connection to Jesus and his body? How strong is that connection? I'm not, I'm not here to throw things at you to say, I take attendance and I'm really ticked off when you don't show up. That's not the thing. I want to I come at that from a positive approach. The positive approach is, if you belong to Jesus, your life is special. And he's created you to, to nourish your spiritual life in a vital connection with him personally and in the context of fellowship with other believers. And I think that is something that we can't, can't just blow off as unimportant. We need time to be here to learn, to receive instruction, to rub shoulders with other people in life. Because you don't know, tomorrow the person next to you might, need a, might be going through a crisis and they need you to pray for them. You might go through a crisis tomorrow and you might need someone to pray for you. And we get that from the body of Christ and the encouragement we go. We've got to keep going. The indispensable resource of God's grace. Grace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is God's undeserved and unmerited favor. It's God's care and concern that he demonstrates for us in his life. The Bible says many important things about God's grace, but I want to just focus on two. It is God's grace that saves us. It's God's grace that saves us. For by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourself. The very spiritual life we have that we embrace through faith in Jesus Christ had its origin in the gracious, undeserving favor of God to us. God didn't have to save us. 
He didn't have to send Jesus to this world to be our... God didn't have to do that. God wanted to do that. He wanted to lavish His love on guilty, vile, disobedient sinners. That's how much He loves us. Right? And none of us came to experience deliverance from all our enemies. Sin, death, or hell, according to our own will. It was all God's grace in election when God chose to save in His call, extending the gospel to us so that we could hear it at a point in our life when the Spirit of God was working in our heart to bring about regeneration, a change in our attitude about, about Jesus and about our sin, where we saw that our sins were, were an offense against God and that we saw Jesus came to save us from them. God was at work in regeneration and conversion when we uh, repented of our sins and believed in Jesus. It's not only God's grace that, that, that saves us, but it's God's grace that sustains us. It keeps us alive and fresh in life. I continue to desperately need God's grace right now so I can live a life that honors God and lives in obedience to His Word and for the glory of His name. For the grace of God that brings salvation, we learn in Titus chapter 2, has appeared to all men. In my paraphrase, in my understanding of this verse, it says, this grace not only saves us, but it teaches us to deny the pull of secular worldliness and ungodly lust so that we can function with spiritual alertness and doing what is right and what is good and with a clean conscience, a clear conscience of our understanding that pleases God and reflects the transforming power of His grace in our life. It is God's continued resource of grace that I need to keep my life pure. It's God's continued resource of grace that I need to keep my life focused spiritually and to present a convincing testimony to the world of the power of God's grace to change my life. I need God's sustaining grace to help me endure the difficult and trying times of life. I need God's grace to carry me through the physical times of suffering and the personal losses and the times of grief and through the relational hurts and the rejections of loss. I need God's grace. I need God's sustaining grace to forgive, to love, to show compassion and mercy for others, to care for others because of His continued grace supplies me with the humility that I need, and it keeps me aware of what my life would be without His grace. It'd be a mess. It's God's sustaining grace that pays our bills. It keeps us well. It keeps us through times when we are not feeling well. It's God's grace. It's God's grace God's grace that puts food on our table and supplies our need. We need an abundant supply of God's grace to live and function as disciples of Jesus. Do we realize that? Do you, need, do you know that you need God's grace today? Maybe you need God's grace to save you. It's available to you if you've never accepted Jesus into your life. You say, Pastor, I don't know what that's all about. I've never heard that before. The Bible says we're sinners. We're separated from God. God doesn't like that. God doesn't like the people he's created in his own image and likeness to be separated from. So what did God do? God took on human flesh. He came and lived under all the circumstances, ugly of, of life with all of, its, all of its struggles and depression and all of its darkness. And, and Jesus did it without sin. And he offered his life as a sacrifice so that a holy God could be satisfied when he poured out his wrath in his rightful punishment on sin and Jesus took our sin and he gives us his righteousness. Jesus took our sin so that we don't have to experience the wrath of God. Because if you noticed, I read in First, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 how God will pour out his wrath on sin eventually for those who have rejected Jesus Christ. But you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been protected from God's wrath because Jesus Christ covers your life 100% completely. He accepts you. He loves you just the way you are. 
all of your failures, all of your guilt, all of your shame, all the poor decisions you make in life where you just feel miserable about, could, ever, could anybody ever love me? God loves you. God loves every one of us, and he proved it by sending Jesus to die for us. And that is God's measure of grace to us. He wants to save us. He wants to relieve us. He wants to give us a new life. He wants to give us hope. He doesn't want us to live in fear of death. He wants us to know that he's coming again. Jesus is coming to take us back to be with himself. Have you responded to God's grace? Are you responding to God's saving grace in your life? There's another thing. I don't really have time, but God gives us his indispensable resource of peace. Peace is that calmness of the soul, knowing my heart is right with God. My relationship with God is restored. It's right. It's reconciled. I'm at peace with God. Why? Because I'm no longer under condemnation for my sins. It's been covered by Jesus Christ, and I can be at peace. I can live at peace. I can die in peace knowing that my life is right with God because Jesus Christ has made it right, and I've trusted in him. Peace is also comes in being re- reconciled with other people in relationships. And God God gives us peace in our lives when we're able to right ourselves with other people through grace, the grace of forgiveness. Because we know one of the gnawing things in people's lives is they're not at peace. We know that there's an emptiness that's in every one of us when we're born into this world and we're seeking to find, to fill the emptiness, we try a job, we try careers, we, we try to get more education, we try relationship. Somehow, is that going to satisfy? We get the car that we want or we get the house that we want, we get the job that we want, but something's still missing in our life. We, 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 we keep searching. We think maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's the, the, the drug experience or the, the intoxication or the addiction that somehow will fill the emptiness in our soul. And we only know that it's only temporary because there's something gnawing in us. We're not at peace. Why? Because we don't feel like we're reconciled to God and with others. And God says, I want to give you peace. He says, I want to give you peace in your life. I want, to, I want to fill the empty void in your life that you've been searching to have filled. Some people try to fill that void through religion. There's a lot of people who sit in church seats thinking, well, this is the way to peace. If I just do what they tell me to do, somehow that's going to be uh, the result of peace. And I say, you know what? You can't sit in this church and necessarily find peace just sitting here because you're trying to do the right, you're thinking this is, a, this is the way to peace, uh, this is the means to peace, sitting in this church listening to some guy get really excited about preaching this stuff, right? You can only get peace through Jesus. Coming to Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the one who's purchased our peace through his death on the cross, the one who has taken us in a position of being alienated and estranged from God and provided the peace where now we can be accepted by God because of his death to reconcile us to God. Jesus is the answer. You know, it's amazing this world is in trouble. This world is not experiencing peace. This world is trying all kinds of solutions. You look at all the political powers, how they're trying to find an answer to to the gun violence and the destruction that's taking place in this world and all of the the disasters and all of the the heartache and bloodshed, uh, the the racial tensions in all the, the cities. I noticed that the University of Missouri football team is not going to play next week because they want the president of the university University resign because they believe that he's he's being supportive of, of of racist type activities in their university. That's an upheaval, and and there's there's all kinds of struggle. Why? Because man is not at peace, and he'll never be at peace until his soul is at peace with God. You'll never hear Scott Pelley telling you on the news that the problem we have in this world is that people aren't at peace with God. And when we get rid of the guilt of our sin and we can come under the blood of Jesus Christ and be forgiven, then we'll find peace. God's word said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has become our peace. Do you have peace with God in your life right now? Do you have peace with God? Do you know for sure? That your life is right with God because you've accepted Jesus as your Savior to make it right. You can't do it on your own. 
our good works are never good enough. People think, well, if I just do this, and you know what? Even works-oriented salvation never gives people peace because it can't. You never can do enough to cover all the guilt and all the shame and all that comes when our sin estranges us from God. But thanks be to God, he gives us a Savior, Jesus Christ, who forgives us of all our sin. And I know that we all need the indispensable resources of one another. We need the indispensable resource of being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the indispensable resource of God's grace, not only to save us, but to sustain us. And we need the indispensable resource of peace to give my life confidence, to give me inside 100% assurance, rest, that life's okay. Yeah, there's going to be there's going to be battles. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be hurts. There's going to be pain. But I can live at peace knowing that my life is 100% unconditionally accepted by God because I've I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I've reached out to him to save me. So I just like you to bow your heads this morning. Are you taking advantage of the indispensable resources that God has provided you in the body of Christ? in his grace that saves you and sustains you, and in peace. We're just going to play a song for a short second. If there is something that God has placed on your heart, God is calling you to peace with him through Jesus Christ. Because I believe salvation, God calls you right where you are. You can sense him. It's not a feeling, but you can can know that God is calling you to be saved. You want that. You want that peace. You want that. The grace of God in forgiveness. You want to be righted with God in your relationship. You can sense. If God is calling you to that today, I want you to do something very kind of brave. Nobody else is going to be looking at you or saying, I just want you to come. Meet me here at the front. I would like to pray with you. If you sense God is calling you to, 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 to experience peace in your life that you've never experienced before through Jesus Christ. Maybe it's something else. Would you come as God?